Thank you. Um, now, when we conceived of this webinar, there was a firm commitment to banning new petrol and diesel car sales by 2030. However, at the moment, government policy, at least in the planning world, appears to be to aim for as much uncertainty as possible. Whether we concern is concerning the route of HS2. I mean, we may end up with a high speed line between Old Oak Common and Crewe. Uh, whether it's long awaited updates to the MPPF, which we were initially promised in spring 2023, and we'll be lucky if we get them before spring 2024. Of course, EV policy has not escaped this policy of uncertainty. Only a couple of weeks ago, on the 21st of September, our Prime Minister announced a delay on the ban of sale of new petrol and diesel cars to 2035, apparently as a response to the cost of living crisis. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that this leaves uh, EV manufacturers, those involved in the provision of its infrastructure, uh, those involved in um, uh, the legal elements surrounding it, and, and most of all, uh, consumers in a degree of limbo. Is 2035 a firm date or will it be pushed back further? After all, when the ban was originally announced, the target date, of course, is 2040. What I think we can all agree on is that the electric vehicle revolution is here. And whilst the government's decision may slow down the rate of adoption, we're not going to go into reverse gear. Electric vehicles are already a critical component of the sustainable transport system, and they will be so ever more so in years to come. Now, before I introduce uh, my fellow speakers, a bit of housekeeping, we're going to speak for around about uh, 50 minutes uh, with uh, time for questions and answers after. Uh, we've had some questions submitted already, um, uh, but we do also have the question and answer function enabled. Chat is disabled, but the question and answer function is enabled. So if you have any questions, please do pop them in there. We can't guarantee that we'll get through all of them, but we would like to address as many as possible. Turning then, uh, Will, to the next slide, please, I'll uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, to begin with, I'm delighted to be joined as guest speaker by Roisin Norton, um, who is the, uh, the, the lady on the left of your screen. She's the Principal Future Mobility Consultant in Arcadis. She's got a broad range of experience of local, regional and national net zero and future mobility schemes and priorities. Before Arcadis, she worked in policy and strategy at the Transport for London. And uh, at Arcadis, she's assisted a number of local authorities on the rollout of EV infrastructure and implemented a robust approach to net zero mobility schemes, or at least that's what the policy is designed to do. Uh, she's uh, advised private companies on their responses to the challenges of the EV infrastructure pr provision. And um, I called her as an expert witness at the Recharge One planning inquiry, which you'll hear more about later, and where the need for electric vehicle charging was a key component of the case that we were advancing and was her evidence was critical to the successful outcome of that case. Roisin is supported by Simran uh, Mathuru, uh, who's a transport consultant in Arcadis, who's got a number of years of experience at local, regional and national uh, uh, projects concerning uh, electric vehicles and the like. We then, after that, have uh, speaking for you, uh, Ruchi Parekh. Ruchi is one of the leading juniors uh, uh, barristers at the Planning and Environmental Bar. Earlier this year, she appeared in the Supreme Court with our own Estelle Dahan, KC, in the case of Finch, probably the most important environmental case of the year, concerning whether downstream greenhouse gas emissions should be assessed as part of the environmental impact assessment for the extraction of oil. Uh, she's involved in litigation, challenging the government's jet zero strategy and also Sizewell C decision. Uh, she's been recognised in the Planners Women's of Influence in 2023 as one of only two barristers to feature on that list. And she doesn't just um, act for well, one side, as all best barristers, she acts for both sides. And she's on the Attorney General uh, B panel dealing with and acting on behalf of the government in some of the most high, pro high profile cases. Uh, in the planning and environmental sphere, amongst others. Turning then to Ashley, uh, Ashley really doesn't need any introduction. Hardly a week goes by if he's not in the leading case or appeal, or at least his uh, uh, LinkedIn tells us that. His recent cases are too numerous to mention. Um, CJ Fry and Sons, the nutrient neutrality case, which is 
I, I believe, going to the Court of Appeal. Ashley was also involved in litigation in relation to Sizewell C, which is also seeking permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal. And despite his relative youth, um, he's been in the Supreme Court no less than three times, which is three times more than me. Uh, he sometimes finds, somehow finds time to be the general editor of Sweet Maxwell's Journal of Planning and Environmental Law, and he too is on the Attorney General B panel. And then Bernd, finally, uh, myself, my name's Rob Williams. I specialise in planning and environmental law. I do a mixture of inquiry and high court work, some of which, as I say, we'll touch on later. And I'm part of the council team promoting HS2, which may explain my barbed comment earlier. Um, I'm on the Attorney General uh, A panel and deal with um, uh, uh, some high profile government work as well. OK, with those introductions, uh, can I pass over to uh, Roisin, who's going to be dealing with the meeting the need issue. And yeah, it's brilliant to be um, invited here today to talk on the topic of EV charging infrastructure. Even withstanding all the political issues that are going on at the moment, it still remains a priority for us. And we're glad to see it remains a priority for lots of manufacturers and local authorities to, to continue that emphasis on, on rollout. Uh, I'll hand over to Simran just to give a bit of an introduction of who we are and the context of the UK in terms of the rollout of EV charging infrastructure. Oh, best slice. Perfect. Morning, everyone. Um, so, yeah, Boom Machine are from Arcadis, which is a leading company delivering sustainable design, engineering, and consultancy solutions. Um, we are a company made up of 27,000 people across 40 countries. Um, and this year alone, we have delivered over 35,000 projects for our clients. And in recent years, this has included the installation of 10,000 electric vehicle chargers. We offer full turnkey solutions from strategy and feasibility to install and maintenance. For our EV strategy solutions, some of our clients have included Transport for London, Transport for the Southeast, and key government fleets to support with their EV fleet transition. Next slide, please. So here shows us a roadmap um, which was uh, made by the government back in 2020. Um, so one of the largest contributors to carbon emissions is the transport sector in the UK. Um, the transport sector accounted for 27% of the total UK emissions back in 2019, um, with cars contributing 60% of this. So back in 2020, the government set out this roadmap, um, which recognises the scale of this challenge. The UK government pushed forward its commitment to ban new diesel and petrol vehicles from 2040 to 2030 and fully convert its public fleet by 2027. The highlight of this map shows that 2030 was when the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles were to be phased out. But as we all know, this has now been moved to 2035 in recent weeks. So I'll now hand over to Rasheen. Next slide, please. So before we get into the delves of uh, infrastructure delivery and EV uptake across the UK, I think it was just worth pointing this out and doing a bit of a stop check on actually what that 2030 or now 2035 phase out of new uh, petrol and diesel vehicles actually means. So this uh, stat here, this table shows you the latest figures from August from the Society of Motor Manufacturing. Uh, and what it essentially it shows is who is the market for new vehicles. And this is just a monthly output. But Annually, what we see is the majority of new vehicle registrations and sales is for commercial and businesses. So actually, your average regular Joe who's leasing or, or buying a car is, does not fall within this bracket. So even in August, 61% of new vehicle registrations were for commercial fleets or businesses. So I think that's worth keeping in mind in terms of who would have been impacted by this 2030 uh, phase out and obviously now 2035 a lot of the um, speech that was made by Rishi was targeted at we didn't want to put more emphasis or more costs to those users but what we can see here is actually the biggest impact is going to fall to businesses and commercial fleets um, and then just linking on to that so in terms of who uh, uh, on average kind of how long people keep their cars 
seven to 10 years. So if you bought a new car in 2035, uh, in 2034, which was petrol or diesel, you're likely still going to keep that car for seven to 10 years. So it's just to say here that petrol and diesel aren't going to disappear overnight. And that's not to downplay um, the EV transition. But even by 2030, the stats that we've seen from the future energy scenarios that the National Grid have produced predict that uh, by 2030, there could be between four and 13 million uh, EVs on the road. So that's still only around 50% of the whole vehicle um, park. So not to downplay EVs, but also just to state that in terms of your average Joe who will be buying a new vehicle, things are likely still not going to change for them for, for many years to come. Um, and, and the real kind of emphasis in terms of impact of this transition and that and that ban is going to be for commercial fleets um, and businesses. Um, so, yeah, just a point to, to make there on who, who the real impact is going to be felt of this. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. So um, the phase out was it was never a ban. So there was never any legal backing behind it. And obviously the people on the call will be able to talk more to that. But it was a phase out and it was designed to catalyze the market to commit to uptaking and um, producing electric vehicles. Um, and that's exactly what it did. What we saw as a result of that, that target being announced in 2020 and being brought forward 10 years was that initially these kind of top 10 EV manufacturers in the UK committed to producing uh, all electric vehicles by 2030. So it did exactly what it was designed to do to the manufacturers in terms of the introduction of that policy. And then that was also um, uh, jointly kind of provided hand in hand by the government, um, uh, setting up these incentives for people to entice them into EV ownership. So there was a plug-in car grant, so that provided a grant of up to £2,500 off eligible EVs, that was any EVs under £35,000, which if oh, lots of people will know that um, EVs are very expensive. So there's kind of limited models. And especially at that time in 2020, there were limited models on the market under £35,000. So you were lucky if you could get that grant. And then that was also um, uh, offered with the EV home charge scheme. So that was a grant up to 75%. Uh, capped at £350 for the cost of purchasing a charging unit. So if you were lucky enough to have um, a driveway and you could charge at home, you could then also subsidise the cost of that charge point. So those are um, uh, shaded in grey to show that they are no longer on offer. They have been pulled from the market now, mainly as a result of their success. They've been so successful that actually people are buying EVs now. The market has caught up in terms of models available, the purchase price is coming down, and the cost of um, charging units is, is, is not too um, uh, expensive either in terms of installing. What still is in offer, on offer is the workplace charging scheme. And I should say the EV home charge scheme is still eligible to some residents. So for example, if you live in a block of flats, you are still eligible to claim for the cost of installing a charging unit. And then you've also got other incentives that are designed to entice uh, uptake of EVs. So the road tax exemption at the moment, we do know that that is also going to be phased out from 2025. So you will still be liable to pay road tax um, subject to your vehicle class from 2025. And then there's lots of other widely offered incentives by local authorities, such as ULES, uh, congestion charge exemption, and lots of local authorities if you have on-street parking offer parking permit exemptions if you have a zero emission vehicle as well. So essentially the policy worked at that time in 2020. It, um, uh, yeah, it, it initiated a large upscale of EVs, which Simran will talk to you now. Next slide, please. Yeah, so following on from the what Rasheen's just said in terms of the government incentives from 2020, the graph on the left shows that the increase of in uptake of EVs has definitely, you know, shot up in the past few years, which basically shows now from May 2023, 16.9% of all new car registrations in the UK were EVs, which at the end of May 2023, highlights that there are now over 780,000 fully electric vehicles on our UK roads. However, that is there is still 38 million licensed um, vehicles still on our roads. So the percentage of EVs as a proportion of all our vehicles on the road is still quite limited. But, you know, in 
the recent years it has still been growing. The map on the right shows us that London is leading with example at the moment with just over 4% of their vehicles um, being EVs in comparison to Northern Ireland and Wales, which are still slightly behind with just over 1% of their vehicles on the road being EVs. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, comparing the UK across other countries, um, we thought it'd be good to just give a quick overview of some work that Arcadis have done in partnership with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So last year, we released this Global Charging Infrastructure Market Report, which features 21 regions around the world, and it analyzes five critical parameters to determine how well prepared each region is when it comes to investing in infrastructure to enable that transition to electric vehicles. So the five parameters identified, which you can see uh, on the screen, they were deemed to be the most influential when it comes to measuring a region's market readiness for investment. And they've been used to determine what regions are doing well and where they could improve. So currently the UK is still behind other European countries when it comes to the volume of public charge points available. Um, and we still have some problems to alleviate in terms of transitioning in the UK to, to have more available charge points um, publicly and encourage more people to charge at home or at work. So in terms of that behaviour change um, transition, uh, if we just uh, go back one slide. Yes, that's it. Um, so government leadership is obviously uh, within the UK indicator. Uh, helped to significantly boost the UK's place in the ranking table. So the UK is third overall, but um, you'll see that uh, the government leadership really helped to bring that up in terms of it was second at the time of producing this last year. Obviously, with the changes that have now taken place, that will need, now to be, need to be reassessed, uh, given the recent pushback and where that then puts the UK in terms of that overall ranking is yet to be determined. But just a taste of where we are um, across the globe in, term, in terms of the rollout and um, EV uptake. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, exactly what's happening in the UK. There's a lot going on in this slide, so I'll take you through quite slowly. Um, but infrastructure to date has mainly focused on destination or fast charge points. And going forward, we think there definitely needs to be a focus on a more connected network of rapid or en route charging points and on street provision. So if we just explain a little bit about the different speeds and types of charge points. So slow, fast, rapid and ultra rapid are typically what they're known by or what you'll hear from people in terms of when they describe what the infrastructure is is. is. Um, the power rating and therefore the speed of charge dictates suitable locations for different types of charge points generally. So slow and fast chargers are ideally suited to locations where customers intend to park for a relatively long period of time. So think about homes, workplaces, car parks, residential streets. Um, so they're known as residential or destination locations. Rapid and ultra rapid chargers are suited to locations where drivers wish to stop for a shorter period of time and then continue their journey. So, for example, on the strategic road network is ideal. So much like how we use petrol stations at the moment to just top up en route to your end destination. So as of April this year, so there is a bit of a lag in terms of reporting for the installation of charge points. But as of April this year, which is the latest data we have there were 40,000, just over 40,000 um, public electric vehicle charging devices in the UK. So 47% of them were destination or fast chargers, and 34% of them were on street or slow chargers. So there's also, uh, in, in tandem with this, significant regional disparity in terms of uh, where the, these charge points are and the availability of them, with more provision in densely populated areas than in rural areas. London, for example, has a third of all charge points in the UK and the southeast closely following with 12% of all charge points. So we can see another north south divide emerging in terms of access to infrastructure and the pace that this is rolling out. And that's also true for on street charge points as well. So that stat at the top there shows you there's going to be a huge reliance um, for people for EV charging on street. So where they don't have access to a driveway or off street parking where they can install EV chargers. So 
At the moment, 8 million households do not have access to a drive or a garage to install a charge point uh, at home. And that also goes, there's a benefit there when you can install charging at home because you can as access domestic electricity rates, which are much cheaper than public charging rates. Um, so there's a, a kind of yeah a social and um, accessibility um, uh, interest there as well in terms of um, how much you pay for your charging. And what we know is people today, the early adopters that have switched to EVs, most likely have done so because it's easier for them to. They likely have a charge point at home. And we know that for those that it's hardest to do, the switch is yet to come. So essentially, we've done the low hanging fruit and the hardest people to transition. We still haven't even touched. Next slide, please. So this is purposely quite a plain slide. It's really designed to show you where we have to get to. So you can see the pace there. This was taken from the National Infrastructure Commission report, um, the progress review that was published at the end of last year, and they'll do the same at the end of this year. So 2022 is blank in there at the moment, but I've put in there a, um, an indicator for where we think we'll be by the end of 2023. So there's, there's an ambition that we'll hopefully get to 50,000 charge points um, by the end of this year. But at the beginning of this, this year, there were just over 37,000 charge points in the UK. And from the previous year, that was an increase of 8,600 charge points from January to January. So taking charge, the National Electric Vehicle, uh, Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Strategy highlighted, highlighted that there might be a minimum need for 300,000 charge points by 2030 and a maximum of kind of four. 480,000, depending on the pace of uptake. So it's been heavily criticised in the industry that it is too low, but that's an indicator that we've got to go on at the moment. And at the rate of delivery, so if we only delivered 8,600 last year, the UK was on course to miss that 300,000 public charging points target uh, by more than 20 years. So if we, were to, if we were to reach that target, delivery of infrastructure would need to accelerate to around 38,000 charge points per year, or 735 charge points installed per week. So that's a huge number. And even though the goalposts have been moved, so we're now looking at 2035, we're still at the pace of current delivery, likely to miss that by 15 years. So the message here is it's going far too slow um, and we really need to pick up the pace um, of EV infrastructure if we're going to reach those, um, uh, those, those. It's not a target in terms of the infrastructure they've predicted we may need. But if we're going to be able to provide all the infrastructure that people will need uh, if EV uptake um, uh, reaches those levels. So a massive gap to fill um, there. If we go on the next slide, please. So we're all left asking the question, why has it been so slow? Like what is taking the time in terms of uh, this rollout? Why are we not picking up the pace given we know the gap is huge? We know there's a lot of funding available. Um, why are we doing this so slow? And I think this is really important here. This is, and this isn't a comprehensive map of the ecosystem of what's happening um, in the EV infrastructure rollout, but even just as a taster, this shows you who is involved or who needs to be involved uh, in terms of rolling out EV infrastructure. And it's inherently complex with many stakeholders who've never worked together before. We've got regulation that is outdated or not fit for purpose when, we, when we're thinking about infrastructure um, delivery. And it's still an emerging industry with new technology and commercial models developing all the time. Local authorities have never had to deal with refueling petrol or diesel vehicles, for example. And overnight, they've been given this responsibility uh, for providing EV infrastructure that, that they've had very little to do with in the past. Even when we think about local authorities and who's involved within the local authorities, those teams sit very siloed, haven't worked together before in terms of energy, highways, policy, um, and trying to bring them together to create these seamless um, systems and processes is a really difficult task for them to do, as well as having limited funding themselves and limited or um, uh, precious resources in terms of um, what they can use people to do and to roll out infrastructure. So it's not surprising that it's that it has been quite slow. We've got many barriers to overcome, but that's where the emphasis at the moment needs to be. Um, we also need the appetite and political will to deliver EV charging. And what we've seen at the moment, there's no regulation or legal duty for local authorities to install EV charging. So government has now introduced policy that will mandate 
um, uh, progress on EV infrastructure to be made by local authorities, but we've only seen that introduced this year. So we've still got a very long way to go. Uh, I'll hand it back over to Simran now. Perfect, next slide, please. So yeah, as Rasheen said, um, the industry has now been provided with clarity on the government's commitment to the net zero transition with the ZEV mandate levy enforcing increasingly stringent EV sales targets on car and van makers from 2024 to 2030. So this was just released last week um, and confirmed that manufacturers will still be subject to ambitious sales targets for the sale of electric vehicles. There's still some analysis that needs to be done from what we're seeing from the market, but not much has actually changed. So in essence, the ship has left the dock and uptake will continue with manufacturers such as Toyota in recent days, continuing to still commit to the 2030 target. So despite this target being extended, companies are still working towards the original target and planning on beating it. So car manufacturing companies such as BMW um, are still planning to increase their delivery share of all EVs to 50% from 2025 onwards, um, with a focus of reducing their carbon footprints across the life cycle. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Simran. So yeah, in terms of where, what do we need to do? Where do we need to go next? Just a few key points here uh, to end on. So we need a breakdown in the policy and regulatory bar barriers to deploying EV charging infrastructure across the board. So some examples, DNO rights, DNO pricing, a right to charge, sex, Section 50 licenses, Road Traffic Regulations Act all need reforming. We need to simplify and streamline the installation of EV charging if we're going to meet the need um, of, of users in future. We need, uh, it goes without saying, less government U-turns. So luckily the industry has backed this because we all know it's the right thing to do, but playing politics isn't helping with this. We all need to sign up and commit to um, the net zero transition and, and stick to it essentially. And what do we need to be doing more of? Engaging directly with the private sector, supermarkets, service stations, all have major commitments to install EV charging infrastructure now, but engaging is still quite siloed. So that's between private sector organisations, government institutions, local authorities. Local authorities at the moment don't have an official route or um, platform to engage with the private sector to know what's happening in their areas, to know what the commitments are by local supermarkets or service stations to inf install infrastructure. And that really needs to be fed into local and more regional EV strategies so that we can plan uh, more strategic um, a delivery of infrastructure across those um, locations. We need to explore shared charging strategies. So we know that land is limited. We know that uh, grid capacity is the number one barrier to installing EV infrastructure across the UK right now. And this is where I think people really need to be talking to each other. So where we've got government institutions who are all struggling to meet the ambitious targets, can they potentially share charging infrastructure where we've got bus garages that are electrifying with really high powered rapid charging, but we know buses are out on route all day. Can we share that with local authorities or local delivery companies to use that infrastructure while buses are out on service all day? One of the biggest issues with DNOs at the moment is they're not legally bound to share information about applications that have come in for grid upgrades. So two applications might come in for grid upgrades from neighbours and they aren't allowed to share that information where they could both achieve economies of scale and uh, save an awful lot of money and time by submitting that upgrade request together rather than separately. So we really need a platform for people to be able to engage on this and understand what each other are doing and what their plans for EV charging are. And then building close relationships with DNOs and engaging early as I said, it's the number one issue at the moment is grid capacity and grid upgrades across um, the system to be able to install that EV infrastructure. So really start early, even before you think you have a plan for EV charging, find out who your local DNO is, engage with them, what's their plans, what's happening, what are their issues, so that you don't face these lengthy delays that we're seeing, so that you'll, you have a heads up on what's happening. And um, the, the number one point to leave you all on is really to take action now. We've got a little bit of breathing space by this 2035 phase out now. 
um, which has been pushed back from 2030. But that's definitely not to say to take the foot off the pedal. We really need, we've seen the pace of rollout of infrastructure is not keeping up with EV um, uptake. We really need to keep going and we need to make sure that we create this streamlined uh, and simplified process for installing EV infrastructure. And that needs to be happening now. We certainly don't need to be taking our foot off the pedal just because the target's been pushed back by five years. So I'll leave it there with you. Um, thanks again for inviting us. And hopefully that was a useful share for you all and happy to answer any questions at the end. Thanks, Roisin. Um, Right, so I'm going to pick up now and my task for this morning is to cover the policy position on EV charging. Um, next slide, please. Um, as Rob has indicated, there's a real risk at the moment that anything you want to talk about will no longer be policy by the time your talk has actually come around. And so the announcement two weeks ago on um, the delay or pushing back the ban on fossil fuel cars to 2035 was quite unideal on a personal level. Um, but stepping away from my personal inconvenience, I just want to touch on the scale of the problem that we're dealing with. Um, now, as Simran already mentioned, the transport is the largest emitting sector of greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. And um, she gave you some figures, but within that kind of overall transport um, emissions, 91% comes from road transport. So if the transport sector is going to be decarbonized consistently with the government's domestic and, and international net zero targets, then EVs are going to need to play a very big role in hitting those targets. And so as Roisin's just mentioned, while the date for the ban on petrol and diesel cars has been pushed back, it's fair to say that there's every reason to press ahead with rolling out the necessary infrastructure. And luckily, um, there hasn't been a change in kind of policy on that front yet. Um, so on the next slide, please, um, just with the final caveat that I was running late this morning, so I haven't checked if all my materials are still up to date, which in this climate poses a real risk. But I am going to touch on the policy position. I'll look at national strategy, national planning policy and guidance, and then take a look at what's happening at the local level. So next slide, please. In terms of the national strategy, Roisin touched on this very briefly. This is from March 2022. It's still up to date. Um, it identifies charging infrastructure as the biggest, single biggest challenge to decarbonisation of the transport sector. And its vision, as you've heard, is for minimum charging points um, to be 300,000 across the road network. Now, um, Roisin's already commented on how we're going to get there, if we're going to get there, and whether that be enough. But in terms of what the strategy sets out, um, it relies on two main strands for delivery. And so in the first instance, the rollout of high powered chargers on the strategic road network, this will involve the establishment of um, 950 million fund and ensuring that move to service areas have a minimum number of high powered EV chargers. There is supposed to be a consultation on this, but we haven't seen the consultation yet. Um, and then the second point or second strand of delivery is the reliance on local on-street charging. And again, the idea is to put an obligation on local authorities subject to consultation to develop and implement local charging strategies. Now, again, we haven't seen the consultation, um, so that's still something to come. In terms of other areas that are not on the slide, the strategy does talk about destination charging, home charging. Um, the government strategy says that their aim is to remove any existing barriers and basically step out of the way. As part of this, they committed to consult on measures to make traffic regulation orders more straightforward. Um, but again, um, that's... Uh, no, hang on, sorry. This one, the consultation has taken place, but we're awaiting the government's response. So something is happening. Um, on the next slide then, please, we see the, what the policy position in the NBBF. Now, there's two paragraphs dealing with EV charging. Um, it's limited. It's not revolutionary. The NBBF rarely is. But what I would say is that it does provide enough of a baseline for local authorities to then take, um, well, local authorities and developers to, to take these paragraphs and then drive the issue forward. Turning then to the next slide, in terms of um, planning policy guidance, the national strategy said that by 2020 summer, they would consider amendments to the transport planning practice guidance relating to charge points to enable consistent and streamlined delivery. But nothing has come forward. So you're afraid nothing really to talk about here. I just wanted to include a funny gift. So that was the only point of the slide. Um, the next slide, please, in terms of other guidance and something to actually talk about. Um, in the summer, I believe, of 2022, um, government did issue guidance for local authorities. 
So the guidance identified that they have a crucial role to play in enabling this transition to zero emission vehicles. And they're well placed to do so for a number of reasons. One being that they're responsible for planning policies, including um, street alternations and parking. Second is that they already own infrastructure such as lampposts and bullets that can all be adapted to include charging infrastructure. And then third, they own local car parks. So again, this can be adapted. Um, in terms of what they ask local authorities to do, they say they need to lead the way by devising longer term strategies, considering options to decolonize their fleet and engaging with businesses and publics in the local area. The strategy also sets out a number of um, funding schemes, including the local EV infrastructure fund. Um, again, this is all really quite basic and high level, and it really leaves a lot to the local authorities in terms of how to forge a way forward. So turning then um, to the next slide on what's going on at the local level, um, it's probably fair to say that despite all the owners shifting to local authorities, it's it's not been like a huge kind of rapid uptake. Um, and that's a recent survey found that nine out of 10 authorities are yet to implement an EV charging infrastructure strategy. Um, so on the slide, we've got a few examples of where authorities or a number of combined authorities have grouped together to produce a strategy so the Transport for Southeast um, strategy was produced in conjunction with Arcadis. So unsurprisingly, it is one of the most comprehensive strategies that we found um, online. Um, the Transport for Southeast covers 16 local transport authorities in Southeast of England. So much of this work will undoubtedly filter down to indiv individual local authority strategies. And we're starting to see some of that already. Um, and then in terms of um, the last slide, please, Will. Just a few examples of how EV charging has also been embedded into local plan policies or in some cases in supplementary planning documents. Now, SPDs may not be part of the development plan, but they can be a weighty consideration, um, material consideration, particularly where they specify that, um, you know, these are the minimum standards that need to be met to demonstrate compliance with an individual local plan policy. So, again, I think they have an important, they can play an important role. So first example in kind of red slash pink is from the London local plan. There are similar policies for retail and commercial developments as well. And they're quite specific local plan policies. Um, and so I think it's, a, you know, it's worth bearing in mind that local plan requirements can can be, can be fairly specific and they can also, if if you want, can they go, they can go beyond the requirements in the building regs. And then the second example on the um, in white is taken from Leeds City Council Transport SPD. This has uh, quite a lot of detailed guidance on off-street and on-street infrastructure, both in terms of layout and provision, including minimum specifications. Um, so again, it's a good one to look at if you're um, looking for inspiration. So just in terms of concluding remarks then, Perhaps what it, it, you know, just restating what Rasheen said really is that, you know, while there might be a lack of real drive from central government at this point in time, the reality is, is that local authorities and developers are really best placed to set the pace and to drive the EV agenda forward. And so notwithstanding that we've seen this sort of pushback of the ban on fossil fuel cars from 2030 to 2035, I think that there's real opportunity right now to do quite a bit so that by the time we get to 2035, we're actually ready with the infrastructure in place. So that's all from me, and I'm now going to hand over to Ashley. Thank you very much, uh, Ruchi. Uh, well, every webinar has to have a boring section, and this is what's coming up now. I'm going to deal with two uh, dull but important things. One is whether retrofitting EV charging points or upstands requires planning permission. And secondly, uh, to anticipate some of the questions that we've uh, helpfully been submitted in advance, the overlap and interaction with the building regulations regime. So if I could have the first slide, please. Um, we think that uh, introducing a electric vehicle charging point uh, or placing a freestanding upstand is likely to amount to development um, because uh, broadly speaking, putting a charging point unit on the side of a building is likely to change in a material way, its external appearance and uh, upstand um, by virtue of its permanence and perhaps more importantly, its annexation to the land. Obviously, it's attached to the land. It's likely to amount to development. That That's subject, of course, to the situation, unless you can bring yourself within the exemption in Section 55 of the 1990 Act, which is works in the highway, so first of all, if they are an upstand in the highway, and secondly, whether it could be said that they amount to an improvement 
or maintenance indeed of the highway. I think that's going to be personally quite challenging, but just to flag that if something is in the highway and it is for its improvement and not EIA development, it may be exempt from development requirements. So on to the next slide then. Um, it would probably need planning permission, uh, but um, for the fact that there is likely to be a deemed grant of permission covering both scenarios, so for electric outlets, um, part two, which is the minor development provisions of the GPDO, um, sets out that permission is deemed to be granted for electric outlet for recharging of vehicles subject to uh, a number of conditions, as is the way with the PD order. Um, firstly, it has to be an area that's lawfully in use for off-street parking, so someone's private driveway or car park. Um, it doesn't exceed uh, 0.2 of a cubic metre. It doesn't face out or onto or within two metres of highway. It's not a scheduled monument or listed building. Uh, and of course, if it is uh, to be removed, if the need goes away, uh, then the um, facade is made good. And then secondly, if I could have the next one, please, Will, uh, for upstands, there's a complementary set of deemed uh, permitted, deemed planning permissions uh, under a permitted development class, still under part two, this time class E. Uh, similar requirements, really has to be an area lawfully in use for off-street parking, has some height requirements that exempts um, heritage assets, anything affecting them, uh, and uh, there can't be more than one per parking space, and there's a similar make good provision. So uh, under the development control regime, uh, in summary, uh, upstands or electric vehicle charging points on the sides of buildings uh, likely to be development. Development needs planning permission, but planning permission likely to be granted, uh, deemed to be granted through a development order through the GPDO, and therefore there's probably, in most cases, uh, no need to make an express application for planning permission as long as you don't fall foul of any of those conditions. So what's the interaction then with the building control regime? Um, many of you will know that last summer, um, July 22, there were extensive amendments to the building control regime, including um, Part S introduced into Schedule 1 of the Building Regulations 2010. Um, that makes provision for the... Um, uh, electric vehicle charging point and infrastructure uh, and particularly requires pretty much in summary that new residential buildings or indeed conversions changes of use to a residential building have electric vehicle charging points uh, and infrastructure um, and that probably means that um, requirements for a financial contribution towards um, the provision of new electric vehicle charging points for their associated infrastructure is unlikely to be necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms because there is already uh, a requirement under the building regulations to put those things in. And indeed, there is already uh, an appeal decision that deals with this point. Uh, it is um, 76 Algers Road, A-L-G-E-R-S Road, Loughton, IG10, 4 and F. Uh, 31st of March of this year, uh, and the PINs reference number is 3291871, 3291871, and that inspector uh, accepted there that the, there wasn't a, a need for, it wasn't justified to require a financial contribution because of Part S of the building regulations. But then well, are, are they relevant at all? Well, um, I, I think they are relevant to planning because, um, first of all, most important points really for planning policy, as Ricci quite rightly said, um, the, the, it will be perfectly entitled for a planning authority to adopt a development plan policy or a supplementary piece of guidance that went beyond the requirements of the building regulations. So I'll take one example. There is a cap. Um, of £3,600 per connection. Um, if you were to exceed that, there isn't, uh, you don't need to put in the electric vehicle charging point. Uh, a planning authority could uh, adopt a policy that went beyond that requirement. So that's the first area where it'd be relevant. Um, secondly, the effects of complying with the building regulation regime it is capable of being a material planning consideration. Um, in particular, if the effects of installing electric vehicle infrastructure had material planning effects, i.e. things that affected the character of the use of that land or neighbouring land, um, then it is likely to be uh, material 
to take into account um, the building regulation requirements when you are granting planning permission. Um, and finally, the, the, the third area where it seems potentially uh, relevant what the building regulations regime has to say is to ask yourself when granting planning permission whether it is capable of delivering the project um, in line with the requirements of the building regulations. Uh, that would be if, for example, the delivery of the project within a specified period of time was particularly important and was being taken into account. I think, for example, of housing schemes coming forward where it is praised in aid that they will make a, a material contribution to a five-year land supply, it would be relevant to, in those circumstances, explore their delivery and their delivery timescale. And indeed, in, in those circumstances, look to see whether compliance with the building control regime will cause that delivery to be thrown into doubt. So there, there is, um, they are separate regimes, but they do um, potentially affect one another, or certainly the building regulations regime has effects on the development control regime. Uh, and that they may well still be taken into account. And probably the most important takeaway is that planning policy can, uh, if it chooses to go beyond the requirements of the building regulation um, part S. So with that, I'll hand over to Rob. Thank you, Ashley. Um, as if any of you have been to a planning crime, I'm sure you have before, uh, you'll know that one of the rules, if not the, the main rule you need to know is you should never ever trust a time estimate given by a barrister. And we are maintaining our reputation here because it's likely that we're going to be running a little over. Hopefully you will bear with us. Um, I'm going to be speaking for about 10 minutes or so uh, on the uh, particular EB case study, EB charge one. And then we'll move to um, questions and answers and hopefully wrap up by uh, 10 past uh, or quarter past 12. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if we can move to the next slide, please, Will. Uh, this is a case study uh, concerning a uh, appeal in which I was involved in and went to an inquiry. And it was an appeal that concerned an EV recharging uh, station. And I, I thought it'd be of interest to talk you through it for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, as far as I'm aware, it's only the second EV uh, recharging station to go to an inquiry. Uh, there was one a couple of years prior. Uh, but secondly, it's located, it was located, to be located in the South Downs uh, National Park, where understandably there are national and local pl planning policies which are particularly uh, restrictive about development coming forwards in, in that area. And I was going to look in particular at how the evidence of need for EV provision, that evidence given by Roisin, played an important part of the role of the successful appeal. Now, the South Downs National Park was designated back in December 20, uh, 2002 for its natural beauty, its wildlife and its cultural heritage. And it's possibly most famous for the South Downs Way, which runs east to west through it, detailed on that map, a 100 mile uh, walking and cycling uh, trail. And we can see from the uh, photograph a classic scene from the South Downs of rolling uh, countrysides, dramatic escarpments, but it's not devoid of settlements or development, far from it. Now, the site in question was just to the um, west of Burriton, which is marked on the map, and just off the uh, A3. And if we move to the next slide, please, Will, we can see the context for the um, appeal site in question. Uh, not all parts of a national park are created equally, and this certainly wasn't our case, was created uh, equally. Uh, the site, which is the site that's uh, surrounded by the A3 and its slip roads, uh, uh, as I say, was surrounded by road infrastructure. It had a roundabout in close proximity. It, you can see from the photograph that there was a line of prominent houses, and there was also what you can't see is a, a working quarry uh, just out of uh, picture. So this wasn't a, um, a, a, an unspoiled area of the National Park. And we can also see that the condition um, uh, was not particularly attractive from the lowest um, photograph. Notwithstanding that, of course, um, there is still, uh, as I say, restrictive policies in play, which we'll come to in a moment. Can we go to the next slide, please, Will? The proposal was for a mixed-use development. Um, it, it wasn't a classic service station. It wasn't simply uh, EVs. It, it wasn't a kind of grid-serve um, product. It, it was a... Uh, 
a mixed use, as I say, uh, scheme where there were 79 EV chargers of a variety of speeds. You had your ultra uh, fast chargers for those who wanted to plug in and go, but you also had um, slower speeds for those who may want to use the um, facilities on site, but also for those who wanted to stay on site and explore the National Park. And that was a key element of uh, the uh, proposal's uh, attraction. It had um, an earth sheltered commercial building within which there was a car, there's to be a cafe and farm shop where lo local produce is to be sold. There's an information centre there and there would be e bike hire, all of those are secured by conditions and the 106 agreement. And then there were 44 uh, eco lodges uh, that were chalets, they each had their each dedicated um, EV uh, uh, space and charger and it was expected that those would be used by business persons during the week um, and then as holiday accommodation during the weekends and school holidays because this is a site that's not only within the National Park but in close proximity to the South Downs Way, in close proximity to Butzer Hill and a number of the settlements around. Importantly it was entirely off-grid once it was up and running powered by a combination of biogas and solar and as I say it was, it was proximate to um, the South Downs Way. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please, Will. Uh, we can see some of the artist's impressions here of uh, what was being proposed. We particularly can see from the middle uh, screen where the uh, uh, lodges were being proposed and on the closer side was the um, EV chargers and uh, within the middle, not seen from that photograph, but you can see from, uh, from that artist's impression, but you can see from the other artist's impression was the earth sheltered building which uh, contained the commercial elements. Um, if we can go to the next slide please Will. Thank you. As I say national policy uh, sets a very high bar for development in uh, uh, national parks as it does for areas of outstanding natural beauty especially in relation to uh, this applies especially in relation to greenfield sites outside of settlements. Um, uh, in all cases Great weight should be given to conserving and enhancing the landscape and seeing the beauty of national parks. And in terms of uh, major developments, you have to meet the uh, exceptional circumstances test where it can be demonstrated that the development is in the public interest. And you need to have consideration to those three factors listed at 177 the need for the development, the cost and scope of providing it elsewhere, in effect, considering alternatives, and uh, the extent of any detrimental effects and to the extent that they can be. Um, uh, uh, mitigated. Now, the South Downs National Park refused that uh, uh, application. It went on appeal earlier this year uh, in front of Inspector Boniface. We had a two week appeal, and there were various experts called on landscape and visual matters, on the technology involved, on the design of the project, on the hotelier giving evidence on the accommodation need. But as I say, one of the key uh, components of our case was the need for EV infrastructure at the national, regional and local level. And uh, Roisin gave that uh, evidence that we can, uh, she summarised earlier at a national level, uh, requiring uh, 735 chargers to be installed per week in order to get to the 300,000 chargers by 2030. At a regional level, there needed to be a, a significant step change in delivery. And at a local level, rather than the proximity of the site, there were only a couple of um, uh, charges on uh, existing petrol station forecourts, which were really never going to service the um, uh, demand. Now, if we turn to the next slide, please, Will. Thank you. Um, the appeal uh, decision, there was a quick turnaround. Um, the inquiry um, uh, closed on the 7th of March and the uh, decision date was the, the 29th of March. And uh, as I say, the appeal was allowed uh, we can see from the um, middle photo, these are extracts from the uh, Mr Boniface's decision letter from paragraph uh, 61, that uh, the local planning authority themselves, that the um, uh, National Park Authority had accepted there's a national, regional and local need for a huge rollout of electric vehicle charging points in appropriate locations. Frankly, they, they didn't challenge Roisin's evidence on that. And the inspector uh, went on to say at paragraph 61 at the bottom that the infrastructure must be facilitated and will be required on a significant scale if a cultural shift is to be achieved. Uh, those were his words. He didn't lift those from my closings. Paragraph 62, uh, he went on to say that the National Park is not exempt from that need and that the delivery 
of um, the significant number of uh, charging points on the very busy A3 trunk road was very beneficial in his uh, words. And at the bottom of paragraph 62, he said, in short, the country and the national park in particular is nowhere near the threshold of EVCP provision, where it can be argued that there's no demonstrable need for more. And um, I haven't highlighted the paragraph 63, really the only argument against the level of need put forward by the South Ash National Park was that we got the mix wrong and that, that there should have been more um, uh, high and very um, sorry, rapid and uh, very rapid um, charges um, and that it was actually de detrimental to have a, a more balanced mix. Our case was that, well, actually, um, that, that isn't the case. It meets the philosophy of this development to have a mix of slow and faster charges because some people want to uh, plug in overnight when they're staying. Some people want to plug in all day when they're going out and enjoying the um, uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, uh, Country Park, which is nearby and the like. And some people will want to uh, plug in and go. And so it's appropriate uh, to have that mix. And he accepted that argument. And then finally, the planning balance um, uh, over the page, he, uh, paragraph 82, um, he noted that the proposal would deliver numerous benefits. I'm obviously focusing on the EV benefits, but that was the first one he touched upon, notably the much needed electric vehicle charging facilities of various types, um, as well as the tourist accommodation, which is needed in the National Park. And um, I would, I, I, the takeaway really um, is, is paragraph 83, where the inspector brings this together and um, tells us that the National Park is not excluded from the effects of climate change, the need to adapt to it or the means of combating it um, it, it, he noted that the authority is set up uh, to do so in its um, uh, some of its stated aims, and the fact it had declared a climate emergency. And um, uh, he, his final words were, far from the authority's stance, this is development is simply wrong in principle within the National Park. It seems to me this is exactly the type of development that would assist in meeting those objectives. So a wholehearted um, backing of this uh, development scheme by the inspector. Now, in terms of the takeaways, of course, this was the right site, I would say that, but it was the right site of development. There was a transport infrastructure in place. It, 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 um, it was already an area of land which was uh, despoiled to some extent, and therefore the landscape and visual harm would be um, uh, at most minimal. But there was still a high bar to uh, get over, and the evidence of need for EV infrastructure was critical in demonstrating that the development was acceptable in planning terms. I should note that the inspector in this case actually accepted the argument this was not major development, so the exceptional circumstances test didn't apply. It would have been interesting to see uh, whether he came to the same conclusion if he thought it did apply. I would suggest, given the nature of his findings, both those in terms of the benefits of the scheme, but also the limited adverse impacts he probably would have done. Um, what I would say is it shows the benefit of, of bringing to inquiries and appeals the evidence of the need for, um, in this case, the EV infrastructure to be in place, but also in other um, uh, related sectors, for instance, the need for um, uh, renewable energy developments, uh, that relying on um, sort of high polluting government policies as a start, but actually having facts and figures and in, uh, a witness who really knows her stuff, as we did with a regime, um, really um, gives some grounding and um, weight to that and um, uh, uh, that evidence and was critical here. Right, that's my presentation. We're just at, gone 12 o'clock and we've still got a decent number of participants here. So we'll turn briefly to the Q&A. Um, a number of the questions that were asked have been picked up in the presentations thus far. So Ash has addressed the questions in relation to buildings regulations and the um, relationship of that uh, with planning uh, controls in terms of the conditions and the 106. Rucci has touched upon um, what role the local plans can have in supporting the role of EV charging. So I won't ask those again. Um, we do have a question from Ed Kensley of Peacock and Smith, and he asks this. He says, capacity in the grid is a major barrier to delivery of EV charging infrastructure. Is battery storage the best route to delivering sites and quicker time scale? I think there could be no better person to answer this than Roshi, so I pass over to you for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in short, absolutely. Flexibility in the grid is something we're going to have to look into even more so than we're doing now. It's at a, a much earlier stage than I would say standard EV infrastructure is in terms of development. So there's a lot going on. Um, in terms of uh, vehicle to grid, vehicle to everything that connects to things like battery storage and solar, which are still in very early commercial stages. 
Um, but absolutely, I would say investment in battery storage and local grid flexibility. I think that's the key thing here where we know grid reinforcement is needed in a lot of cases. We're going to have to look into alternatives such as uh, battery storage, so solar, vehicle to everything solutions to, to enable that transition because we can't um, upgrade everything at the same time. So absolutely, we need to look into alternatives. Thank you, Roisin. Um, the next question, I think I, it falls to me to deal with, uh, and that's a question by Stephen Bainbridge, um, I think of Chapman Lee Planning, um, who has asked the question in the question and answer function. In short, um, he says he's involved uh, with a Intervolt trying to make the link between EV charging infrastructure and the local transport infrastructure exemption in the NPPF power. 150 and that you found a appeal precedent which defines petrol station as a local transport infrastructure and whether the same applies to EV charging. Well, just to set the context for this, of course, um, paragraph 150 of the MPF, I'm sure you know, deals with the um, exception to the uh, usual rule that new development in the countryside would be inappropriate development and therefore would need to demonstrate very special circumstances in order to be granted a uh, uh, planning mission, or at least to have support of national policy to grant planning mission. And one of the exceptions to that uh, is uh, local transport infrastructure, which can demonstrate a requirement for green belt location. And the question really is, do EV charging, does EV charging infrastructure fall within that um, exception? Um, as far as I'm aware, I'm aware of the appeal precedent you are referring to, Stephen, and uh, as far as I'm aware, there's no uh, further appeal precedent um, directly on point concerning EV charging facilities, but I would suggest that there is a strong case to be advanced that the rationale in that appeal decision applies equally to EV charging um, facilities. Indeed, it may apply more strongly given the definition um, uh, within sustainable transport modes that includes, of course, um, ultra-low and zero emission vehicles. And it seems to me that um, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, uh, EV charging infrastructure uh, uh, certainly would fall in the concept of transport infrastructure. The question is whether it would be local or not, and there may be a dispute about that. And um, the um, Recharge 1 might be a good example where the uh, it may be said that the slower and medium uh, speed chargers were, were more designed for the local infrastructure because it facilitated people coming and visiting the national park, whereas the ultra rapid uh, chargers were more for people traveling uh, through. That said, I, I think there would be a good argument that all EV uh, transport infrastructure is inherently local as well as um, uh, national, and there would be a, a decent argument that it, it all falls within that exception. Um, even if it didn't, and very special circumstances needed to be applied, I think uh, the Recharge 1 decision, although it doesn't apply the very special circumstances test, we weren't in the green belt, obviously um, was considering a, uh, a very restrictive policy concerning national parks, and um, uh, I wouldn't um, count it out of all possibility that you could persuade uh, a local authority, a decision maker or an inspector on appeal, that even if that exception didn't apply or didn't apply fully to the development question that you have demonstrated very special circumstances. Obviously, you need to, in those circumstances, rule out um, or, or it would be beneficial to rule out um, uh, alternative locations outside of the Green Belt. But certainly, if you could do that and that that wouldn't address the need, as we sought to do in uh, Recharge 1, then I think you'd have a, a decent chance, a decent stab at um, persuading the inspector there were very special circumstances. Right. Um, are we um, able to pick up anything else? Or I know there are a number of questions that have been answered in the chat um, uh, on in writing. I know Jack Davies answered a question um, that Ash has also come back uh, in in writing. So we won't pick up any more of those. Um, if you've got any particular queries, um, our uh, address is on the screen now. Uh, please do. Uh, if you've got any feedback or questions for the team, or, or if you want to instruct a member of the Cornerstone Climate Team, please do contact the clerks on the uh, email addresses uh, that are set out there. 